couple of things. First off, we're going to go through some of these. Some of these we'll be teaching or going into later on. But first off, it says, If healing is a sign for the unbeliever, what hope does a sick believer have to be healed? Good question. All right. <clears throat> the difference is this. There, <clears throat> for the believer, it's not a sign. Okay? Believers, you have to realize in Mark 16, it talks about two different classes of people. It talks about believers laying hands on the sick. Okay? Now, <clears throat> you have to decide what class you're in. Are you the believer or are you the sick? Okay, you say, well, I'm a sick believer. Don't try to make a third class. All right? It's not there. Okay? Now, a believer should be not the recipient of healing, but the deliverer of healing. All right? You say, okay, that sounds good, but I'm sick. I need healing. Help me now. All right? There are... There are two ways to receive healing. One is, you get it for yourself. Or, number two, someone gives it to you. Right? That's really the only two ways. Now, <clears throat> we could probably be more specific and you know, talk about just what some people would call the sovereignty of God and different things like that where someone just gets you know, healed, nobody knows why and how, and it just happens, that kind of stuff. And actually, usually, what it does boil down to is somebody was praying somewhere and somehow it was directed to that sick person. There's details on that, but at this point, you know, think about it, you'll figure that out. Okay, it's not really near as in-depth as you would think. Um, but, as a believer, as I said in the beginning, my job this week is to get you to a different place. And part of that we do by showing you that it's not in being religious in the sense of following rituals. Okay? We all know that healing by formula doesn't work. Okay? If, if you've been around church, you know, for very long, you've tried the formulas. And the formulas don't work. But it's because it wasn't a formula. <clears throat> the thing that made Dr. Lake effective was not that he understood healing. He didn't understand healing until after he became effective. Okay? Now, just a couple of little things, you know. <clears throat> Most of what I do is just small corrections here and there that overall makes a big difference, but most of the small corrections don't make that big a difference by themselves. Okay? So it's kind of a synergy of everything that goes on. <clears throat> when Dr. Lake started after his wife Jenny was healed, uh, what was that, about 1893. Yeah, 1893. Um, after that, he started, he connected with John Alexander Dowie and started a branch church where he and his wife lived, which was about 100 miles away from where Dowie was. And he became an elder in Dowie's church, even at that distance. And they... Every week, Dowie would produce a book <clears throat> that would be like what we think of as, as a monthly magazine, but it was an 800-page book every week, okay? And he would detail, now, a lot of it was contributed, you know, for him or ed and even edited for him and stuff, but a lot of the writing he did himself, matter of fact, that's part of what brought his downfall, was because he would write for 48 hours straight and just, he physically exhausted himself to the place where he was susceptible to people whispering in his ear that he was the Elijah come again and all that, and he ended up going off the deep end and doing some crazy stuff. <clears throat> but in during that time, Lake was basically started a church and was what they called a deacon in Dowie or an elder in Dowie's church. And this was remember the Pentecostal movement didn't start until 1901, so. Speaking in tongues, the baptism of the Spirit, as we hear it called today, was not a common thing back then. Back then, the baptism of the Spirit, they connected with sanctification. And sanctification had to do with ceasing to sin. It did not have to do with, really, with power or gifts. It led to holiness. Okay? And if you had received what they called sanctification, then you had quit sinning. And you lived a holy life before God. It really, it was power to live a holy life, not power for service. 
which is pretty much what the Pentecostal movement brought in. Now, <clears throat> the Pentecostal movement didn't start until 1901. This was 1893. So even seven to eight years before that happened, before the Pentecostal movement started, Dr. Lake was already seeing tremendous healings. I mean, what we would call miracles. Dowie was seeing miracles. Dowie's never, Dowie's, Dowie never received the baptism of the Spirit and actually taught against it and was very much against most of the Pentecostal movement and started persecution that mainly caused the, the Pentecostal movement. Uh, persecution doesn't ever stop anything, it just spreads it. <clears throat> so the best way to beat something is leave it alone. Right? If you leave it alone, sometimes if it's not of God, it'll die, generally, generally speaking. But <clears throat> Lake was getting all these miracles and healings, and he didn't receive the baptism of the Spirit until October of 1907. So he had greater healings before his baptism in the Spirit than most people have after their baptism in the Spirit. <clears throat> but it was because of who he surrounded himself with. What you, what you think about, you will become. And you are the result of what you think about most of the time. And right now, as you are, you are the outcome of what you think about most of the time. And so if you want to be different, the first thing you have to do is change your mind. Change your thought processes. Change what you think about. Uh, stop listening to every crazy thing that comes around or watching television all the time and start believing the Bible. And find something you believe in and surround yourself with it and with people who believe that. Right? Dr. Lake even, matter of fact, in the back of your manual, you'll find a, uh, a section there called John G. Lake's Secrets of Spiritual Power. And one, he gave seven different things. And one of them is fellowship with like-minded Christians. Meaning finding people that believe like you do and then being around them. Fellowshipping with them. Not just on Sunday, but as often as you can. All right? Um, now, the reason Dr. Lake received the results that he did was not a gift. Not saying gifts didn't operate. I'm saying it wasn't attributed to that. It wasn't an anointing. It was what he understood. It wasn't just knowledge, okay? But Lake didn't heal the sick by a doctrine. He understood who he was. And that's the essence. That's, that's the main thing you're going to get this week. Because right now we're talking about healing and we're mentioning details of healing and, and all that. But you're going to find out here before too long, we're going to shift. Because all your understanding about healing hasn't worked. Okay? And what the body of Christ understands about healing. See, I've had people ask me, not today, but in times past, you know, well, I just think you're arrogant because you think you're right and everybody else is wrong. Okay, first off, the reason I think everybody else is wrong is because I haven't seen anybody produce Jesus yet. All right? That's why I think they're wrong. Okay? That and the results they're not getting proves to me they're wrong. Now, and the reason I believe I'm right is because the results I get verify the Bible, if you want to use that term. Really, I don't like saying it that way necessarily. But what I teach and the results that come from it equal the Bible. Right? Right? Now, somebody has to be right and somebody has to be wrong. I don't, I don't guess somebody has to be right, but obviously, if two people are saying opposite things about the same topic, then somebody's right and somebody's wrong. All right? Now, the, the difference is, you, I, I would, unless something has come up in the last week, I would challenge you to bring a teaching to me concerning healing that I have not studied, investigated, checked out, and dismissed because of the results or the, la or the it not being scriptural. As a matter of fact, um, a lot of the stuff that we do in the church you don't see in the Bible. Okay, You don't see any inner healing in the Bible. Not in the New Testament. You don't see Jesus ever dealing with any of that. All right? And the reason being is this. And, and I don't know where y'all are spiritually, right? But you're somewhere 
because you're pulling. <laughs> we don't usually get around this stuff till like the third day, okay? So I don't know where we're going to go, okay? We're going to cover the material, but uh, apparently, maybe not all of you, but there's some of y'all here that are pretty serious, all right? And you've done some research, and you're ready to do something, because otherwise, I don't hardly ever get going this direction, all right, this fast. Usually, I have to take a lot of time, but um, in... <clears throat> How can I say this? Okay. There, okay, I'll just give you a couple of different things. Uh, Theophostics, okay, it's wrong. All right, it's not biblical, it's new age, and it's not accurate. Okay? I've never known a church that, uh, that adopted that teaching that didn't split. I mean, I'm talking about a serious split. All right? Usually the people end up going back into sin. Um, almost all these new age type teachings do that. Most of the inner healing stuff goes that way. Now the reason, and here's the, here's the problem with some of it. Number one, Jesus didn't do it. You say, well, yeah, but Jesus didn't deal with it. Okay, what makes you think you know what he, de- what he dealt with? Okay, people then had the same problems people do today. People have not changed. Sin is sin. Okay, now, in <clears throat> our problem is, if you don't have power, you will come up with doctrines to try to help people get their healing. Jesus never had to help anybody get their healing. He gave it to them. Right? But the reason we come up with these doctrines is because people don't have power to do it, so they got to help you get the power to do it. Okay? Now, if you have power, and here's a problem with some... not the initial problem, not the, the scriptural problem but just the practical problem of generational curse teaching, is that if you have power to set somebody free, you really don't care where it came from. Okay? Jesus never asked anybody where it came from. Right? The closest he came was, how long has a boy been like this? Right? Matter of fact, somebody even asked Jesus, who sinned? Was it the boy or his father? And Jesus said, neither. Right? Now, if Jesus wanted to expound on generational curses, he could have done it right then. He could have said, but there are times. But he didn't say that. All right? So, now here's, here's what you have to remember. We are first and foremost representatives of Jesus Christ. Amen? Not representatives of, and I could, you know, pick your camp. Okay? Pick your group or wherever your teaching you've heard before came from. All right? you are first and foremost a representative of Jesus Christ. As a representative, you cannot say what the one you represent never said. Is it pretty clear? Right? Because the minute you say something he never said, or the minute you say something that contradicts what he said, you cease being his representative. Isn't that simple? Now, the problem with a lot of these different teachings is Jesus never said them. Right? He never did them. He never practiced them. He never condoned them. He never used them. And matter of fact, he didn't say, now listen, the works that I did, I know y'all want to do them too, but you can't. So since you don't have the power I do, then you're going to have to come up with other ways to do it. Right? He never said that. He said, the works that I do, you should do also. And greater works than these shall you do. Now, greater doesn't mean taking 12 weeks to get it done instead of 12 minutes. Alright? Greater means shorter, faster, better results. Right? Not less results. Now, that's the problem. See, what we want to do is, and and again, here's our problem. All of this stems from a, a lack of understanding of who we are, where we are, and reading the Bible according to who it was written to. Okay? When you read the Bible, especially the Gospels, first off, what are the purpose of the four Gospels? Well, John said, all the things that were written there were written so that you might believe that he is the Christ. Isn't that right? Now, do you believe he's the Christ? Okay. Then technically, now, the Gospels aren't for you. You I'm not saying don't read them. Not saying tear them out of your Bible. I'm just saying let's look at the purpose. Okay? Now, that was to show who he was. 
is, right? But the people that Jesus was talking to could not, if they had been written at the time, could not have claimed the epistles. You understand? Because all the epistles were written to who? Church. The church, right? Now, at the time Jesus was walking on the earth, at the time that he was giving instructions and different things to, for instance, saying things like, uh, you got to hunger and thirst after righteousness. All right. He was talking to unsaved Jewish people, right? Not believers, right? Now, they were not born again because you cannot be born again without Jesus' blood. His blood had not been shed, so they were not born again, right? Now, this is just real basic, simple. The Bible says to rightly divide the Word of God, right? That's been our problem in the church. We hadn't rightly divided. We haven't understood who was for what and all that. Now, just as they could not claim the epistles, technically you can't claim the gospels. I'm not saying it doesn't. You can't read them, and you know there's not truth there. I'm not saying it at all. I'm just saying understand that you're not those people. You understand? You, whenever the woman with the issue of blood, see that's the problem. We come into church, we teach a, you know, a, we, we preach a message on the woman with the issue of blood. Because she said within herself, if I but may touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. Now that's how, if you want to get healed, that's what you've got to do. You've got to say within yourself, and you've got to say within yourself, and you've got to say within yourself, and you've got to keep saying within yourself until you believe it. And get, okay, well, wait a minute, where did that come from? Because it just said she said within herself. Right? And it said that if I can touch the hem of his garment, okay, I've got news for you. You can't do that. Okay? You cannot touch the hem of his garment like she did. Right? He had a physical garment, you know, chased down the Shroud of Turin. Okay? If, <laughs> depending on where you stand on the authenticity of it. Okay? Try to touch that. Maybe you'll get... See, you can't do that. But people go back and they teach those lessons. Now, the biggest problem is, if we're lucky in the church, we get to hear stuff out of the Gospels. If we're lucky. Because most of the time, all we hear is stuff out of the Old Testament. Okay? Which sure ain't for you. You understand? That had nothing to do with you. Okay? Uh, you're not them. Now, here's the problem. When you read the Bible, there's usually three types of people mentioned in a gospel story. There's, Jesus is usually there. Usually there is the disciple somewhere around there. And then sometimes there's a sick person coming up to Jesus. So you got three types of people. you got the sick... You got the disciple and you got Jesus. Now, if you're sick and you read that story, usually you're going to identify with a sick person. And you're going to try to do what they did to get healed. Okay? Which don't work. Okay? Now, if you have any spiritual development, you may identify with the disciples watching Jesus do his thing. Okay? But, technically... The only person in the Gospels that you can identify with is Jesus. Because he's the only person that had the Spirit of God abiding in him. Isn't that right? He is our example. He is our only example. We're not told to follow the example of the apostles or anybody else. We are told to follow Jesus who is our example. Amen? Now, you can not identify with the sick person... Because you have to choose. Are you the person with the Spirit of God or are you the sick person coming for healing? Now, this all goes back to, okay, how do we get a believer healed? Because even here, one of the questions is, uh, is it harder to get a believer healed than it is to get an unbeliever healed? In that, does God require more from a believer in order to get healed? Because to whom much is given, much is required. Now, <clears throat> Smith Wigglesworth said, and again, I'm not quoting him like scripture. I'm just saying this is a statement he made even back before he died. And he said he foresaw, or actually I think he said I prophesy a time when it will be extremely hard to get believers healed. And he said the reason was, he said, because they are finding too many other things to put their faith in. Now, when I went to Africa in 97, first time, tremendous things happened. It was awesome. It was a good time. At the same time, the morning session, I taught 
in a church. We broke for lunch, went to eat. I went with a pastor. We went to his house, came back. When we came back the, after lunch, the church was packed. I mean, twice as many people. And I thought, wow, where'd all these people come from? Because I had just taught one session, and, you know, not a big deal, but pretty much what you'd already heard today, somewhat. And when I asked where, the, where these people came from, the pastor said, oh, because over there my name is Brother Cuddy. Said, oh, Brother Cuddy, you don't understand. Uh, these are the people that were healed during lunch. And I said, well, what do you mean healed? We hadn't had a healing service or anything. He said, when we went to lunch, the people went out and began doing what you taught this morning. Okay, one session, or, you know, morning session. Just went out and started doing it. And, and the double packed was the people that got healed. Well, I mean, first off, I was shocked. I knew the message worked, but I, honestly, I didn't know it worked that good, you know? <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, because they hadn't even got the whole message yet. And I said, well, how do you get your people to do that? I said, I just talked to them, and they went out and did it. How do you do that? I said, man, and back in the States, i got to Greek it, Hebrew it, threaten them, beg them, you know, wor- i got everything I can do, you know? And... I'll never forget his answer because he said, Oh, Brother Cutter, you do not understand. Over here, we don't have hospitals on every corner. Over here, we trust God. We believe God or we die. And I remember, I looked at him, I said, Man, you don't need me over here. We need y'all over there. And and then I I I thought, but as soon as the world, you know, sure as the world, we get you back over here, you'll blend in and we'll ruin you. And so, but it struck me, you know. Then I went, I went back, I was going to a similar God church at the time. Got back, was pastor wanted me to give some testimonies and tell me what had happened on the, on the trip. And I got up and I looked at these people and I was just mad. And I told them, I said, you don't want to hear what I got to say. You, you don't want to hear this. I said, I got testimonies, I got all, you know, you want to hear that, but you don't want to hear the, the truth. I said, because... Over there, they do so much with so little. And over here, you do so little with so much. And I just, I got mad. You know, I gave a couple of testimonies. I just sat down. I'm like, okay, you want to hear something? Here's this. I was walking out of a house one day, and the pastor was going in front of me, and there was an old man standing beside the wall, out right outside the fence. And when I walked past, a little boy was standing next to him, and he said something. I didn't understand it. It was in Swahili. And so when he said something, the man reached out and grabbed my shirt. Right on my sleeve. And it surprised me. I wasn't expecting it. So I turned and knocked his hand off because I'd already been, they tried to pickpocket me in Nairobi. And uh, so I was, you know, anybody started touching anything, it's like, what are, what are you doing? You know? And um, <clears throat> so whenever he grabbed me, I knocked the hands off and he just raised his hands up and I stood there and we, we stopped for a second. He was blind, totally blind, both eyes, milky white. I mean, completely milky white. We stood there and watched him stand like this Tears start running down his face and watched his eyes turn from milky white to brown to black. And he's blinking. He looks. He sees. He saw. And then he turns off and starts walking down the road. And the little boy took off after him. The pastor grabbed the little boy, asked him some questions. Kind of find out somebody had read a flyer to him that the, the, the white healer is what they call you when you go. The white healer is coming. And said, you know, and when he when they read that to him, they said, God spoke to this man and said, Go stand by where he's staying. When he walks out and grab him, you'll receive your eyesight. Now, I didn't do it. You understand? I had nothing I didn't even have you know, sometimes you feel what we call the anointing flow. I didn't feel that. I mean it was nothing. It was him being obedient that got it. You understand? So I told a couple of testimonies like that, a couple of other stuff where God protected us and Amazing things happened. It was an amazing trip. For a first trip, it was <laughs> really out there. But um, the thing about it was that then I went and sat down. And the pastor came up and preached a little bit. And he came and said, Brother Curry, you can't beat the sheep. you gotta, you got to bring them into this. You can't just beat them. And I'm like, well, they need beating. You know? They, so, <clears throat> but the reason I say this is because Dr. Lake did what he did because he understood who he was. That's what you've got to get. It's not a doctrine. It's not a teaching. It's not a secret. It's not, you know, having somebody lay hands on you and get an impartation. You really don't see much of that. 
Even when Paul referred to, I want to come so that I can impart some spiritual gift to you. He said he wanted to impart a spiritual gift, not a gift of the Spirit. You understand? He wanted to give them something spiritually. It didn't mean he wanted to come and take something and put it in them like we talk an impartation. Let me tell you, the greatest impartation you can get is not coming up here and ask me to lay hands on you. See, you can have John G. Lake's mantle. All right? Leave the man alone. He's dead. He served his time on earth. Now he's with the Lord, as far as I know. And leave him alone. Right? There's nothing in the Bible that talks about a person's anointing or a person's mantle. You understand? We do what we do in the name of Jesus. Not in the name of John G. Lake. I may be the head of the ministry. I respect him. I appreciate him. I learned from his teachings. But I'm not here in the name of John G. Lake. You understand? I'm here in the name of Jesus. John Lake didn't die for me. John Lake didn't set me free. You understand? Jesus did it. So I'm here to preach about Jesus and what he did. Not, you know, what he did through John Lake also, but not about John Lake. I refuse for me to do it, and I refuse to be a part of allowing you to get involved in Christian idolatry. You understand? And that's the problem with most of the anointing teaching, not anointed teaching, the teaching on the anointing that's out there today. It in, we end up forgetting God, forgetting Jesus, and we end up putting a man on a pedestal, and we end up talking about this anointing and that anointing, and putting this man up, and putting that man up. And, you know, we got Cal Pierce up here in Spokane that supposedly reopened the healing rooms, which was a lie. And he knew it, and I told him to his face it was a lie. And he still went on with it because those healing rooms... John Lake's healing rooms burnt down in the late 30s. The, the building he was in was completely burned to the ground and rebuilt. All right? Completely rebuilt. Even the way it was situated and the entrances were in different places. The floors in the old days were very big. Now they're more narrow. So every floor is at a different level. There is nothing the same about the building. Okay? The idea of the silver room or what it was, where the carpet was and all that kind of stuff, there was no carpet in John Lake's healing rooms. All right? All that stuff you've heard has, is merchandising the truth. Now, and Cal Pierce goes out to the graveyard and lays on Lake's grave for 14 months regularly and prays, literally, and if you get the, the original book, it's been altered now because he caught some flack on it, but the original book talked about him going out there and praying to get John Lake's spirit, right? Now, that's called spiritualism, right? It is sin, it's wrong, and you don't get a man's spirit. If anything, you get a familiar spirit, okay? We could go further, but I'm, I'm just telling you, this is blunt. I went there, told him, Straight up, this is not that building. He said, well, I know. And shortly after that, he sent some people down to the, or to the uh, library to do research on it, and that's when he verified what I had told him. Then about a couple of years later, I was in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. As a matter of fact, I just got the tapes from this recently. We were going through some stuff, and I found them. I had stood up in the pulpit and made a statement about this very thing and about how that was be that building was becoming a cash cow, basically, and was being used to merchandise God's people. And I said, God is not going to allow it to stand. He's going to do something to bring it down. Now, I was just talking about stopping it, technically. Within 14 days, get the numbers right, within 14 days, the first earthquake to hit Spokane in 75 years hit Spokane, and the only building condemned because of damage was the Rookery building. All right? They had 30 days to move out. They moved into a building down the street on, on First Avenue or whatever it is, and immediately put a thing up on the website saying, our, building, our new building is going to cost $880,000. Help us pay for it. And went that direction. All right? And the whole thing has become a money thing. Now, are they helping some people? Yep, some people are getting help. All right? But they have allowed every type of teaching to come in there. They try to get along with everybody. And if you're getting along with everybody, then you're getting along with everybody but God. All right? Because God doesn't get along with everybody. You know, woe unto you when all men speak well of you. All right? So if you're not stirring up some devils to come after you, then you're not doing much. Okay? And that doesn't mean just because you're having problems. 
that you're right. Jehovah Witnesses use that too. So you can't just use that. You have to discern and find out what's what. Amen? But the bottom line is, truth is truth. And it, it can't be just spun. It has to be presented truly. Now, Dr. Lake did what he did because he knew who he was. Simple as that. He wrote sermons on it, or preached sermons on it. His, when they went to, um, well, I don't want to get into a big history of him at this point, but after they had gone, he got baptized in Spirit October 1907. Within six months, actually April 1st, he left uh, for South Africa. Only been, only received the baptism, and in six months he's a missionary. Okay, We've had the baptism, some people, for 50 years, and they've never witnessed to our neighbor. Right? So maybe what we have isn't the same kind of, kind of baptism they used to get. Right? Then they went down. Uh, he was there in Johannesburg. Within six months, his wife dies while he's on a trip. They bury her before she gets back because he's got a reputation as a faith healer. And so his opponents there uh, wanted to make sure she was buried before he got back because they were afraid he would raise her up and it would cause such a commotion that they would lose more of their people. These are some of Dowie's old people that were coming against him. A lot more detail to the history. I'm trying to put this stuff together. Uh, I leave for South Africa next week or week after next. Uh, <clears throat> we'll be doing teaching for the Apostolic Faith Mission that Dr. Lake founded a hundred years ago. And uh, I was a guest speaker at the 100th anniversary last year. And now they've heard our teaching and they said, this is what Lake taught and we want it back. And so they have adopted this teaching. And I'll be teaching about 2,100 pastors when I go back this very teaching. And then they're going to go out and minister to the people and open healing rooms and different things around there. So uh, God has reunited Lake's ministry, so to speak. And they look at us as, you know, brothers. Um, matter of fact, we're the only people so far that they have acknowledged as a spiritual connection between them So, uh, because of what we taught. Now, when we were there last September, we prayed. And uh, what came out of that actually, while the time we were there, they have now confirmed over 300 people that were healed of HIV. They've got testimonies of every kind of sickness and disease. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, <coughs> this message works anywhere. Not just here in America. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it's not based on what you give. Meaning it's not based on money. Alright? <clears throat> you Now, again, <laughs> believe it or not, I'm not varying off the teaching. It's just coming out at different times than it would normally come out. <clears throat> but you have to understand, healing is a gift. It's a free gift. Amen? I don't mean the gift of healing like the gift of the Spirit. I'm talking about healing as a whole, is a free gift. You can't buy it. Right? <clears throat> we have people that'll, in a healing line, try to hand me money before I pray for them. If you do that, first off, I'm going to throw the money down, and secondly, I'm going to tell you to go sit down because I'm not going to pray for you. I'll pray for you later, maybe, or something, but I will not pray for you then. Right? Because you can't buy what I can give you. You understand? You can't buy it. <clears throat> Don't write your checks out and say, you know, a healing seed. Right? First off, that whole teaching is wrong. Okay? The Bible says, first off, sowing and reaping is a law. It works. But it's an earthly law. Okay? <clears throat> I don't operate under earthly law anymore. I operate under kingdom law. Earthly law says, if you sow, you will reap. It says, go back into Genesis, and it says, whatever seed you sow, you will reap back. All right? That means you can't, that means whatever you sow, you get back. That means you can't sow money and get a healing. Okay? That would take a mutated seed. Every seed returns after its own kind, reproduces after its own kind. Amen? If you sow money, you'll get money. All right? That's okay. I mean, if that's what you're trying for, that's good. It works. All right? J.C. Penney proved that. Uh, R.G. Letourneau proved that. You, they started out tithing, started out giving, started out sowing, and ended up multimillionaires and ended up giving, first off, started giving 10% and living off of 90. And when they died, they were giving 90% and living off 10 and were still multimillionaires. All right? So it works. So I'm not, a, not against that. <clears throat> but understand, I operate under kingdom law. If you operate under sowing and reaping, 
then you better hope that you have sown before the crisis comes up. Right? Because you can't sow your way out of a crisis. You understand? Because well, yeah, you can't sow yourself out of a crisis. Okay? Sowing, there is a harvest time. So when you sow, you know there's going to be a time limit or a time period between sowing and reaping. Now, when you're sick and dying, you don't need a reaping. Right? You understand what I mean? You don't need to sow so you can reap. You need a miracle. All right? Now, miracles are not earthly laws. They are kingdom laws. <clears throat> kingdom law is, my little children, it is the Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Right? Jesus said, <clears throat> they said, you're casting out devils by the prince of devils, Beelzebub. He said, if I'm casting out devils by the prince of devils, who do your sons cast them out by? <clears throat> and he said, nevertheless, know this. If I cast out devils by the finger of God, meaning by the power of God or by the ability of God, then know this. If I do that by the finger of God, then you know that the kingdom of heaven has come nigh unto you. Right? So the kingdom of heaven, the only way Jesus ever, not illustrated, but demonstrated the kingdom of heaven was in displays of power of casting out devils and healing the sick. You understand? <clears throat> sick people needed help then. Demon possessed people needed help then. They didn't he didn't tell them go so. He said, well, you need healing, go go. Matter of fact, whenever he needed tax money, <clears throat> what did he do? Did he say, Peter, I tell you what, take the the money bag that Judas has been stealing out of and go so into some stuff. He didn't say that. He said, Peter, you're a fisherman. Go fishing. <clears throat> Take the first fish and bring the money back. And you know what? He had to tell him that because he was a fisherman. He'd have stayed there all day. You know what I'm saying? So he said, as soon as you get that first fish, you come back. Right? Don't stay there. You gave up fishing. Remember? Come back. Bring the tax money and pay it. You notice Jesus didn't go, oh, well, we, go, well, we better be sowing. I tell you, did we sow for that? He didn't want because he didn't operate it. He needed an earthly thing, but he got it from heaven by operating under kingdom principle. Right now, I used to operate more by sowing and reaping, and it worked. I can give you detailed figures. I mean, I was. I'm telling you, whatever I've done, I've went into it complete. Right? We used to when I would sow, I had a book, and I'd put okay, sowed one hundred dollars, and then I would have it's like a journal, like a ledger. And on the other side, I'd put, okay, 30 times 100, 60 times 100, 100 times 100. What would be the, what's, what's the amount? Then when a problem came up, I'd say, okay, oh, I'd, I would find the figure that matched my problem. And then I would say, okay, Father, I, I claim that because that's where I'd sown and I need that reaping now. Thank you. And, I would, and then I would, whenever the money came in, I'd cross it off. Because I couldn't use it again because I'd already, you understand, I'd already reaped off of that sowing. So I couldn't use it again. It worked. All right? Now, I'm not telling you to do that, but that's an earthly way of doing it. That's an earthly law. Kingdom law is much better. Kingdom law means if I give him all of me, I got everything he's got. Right? That's covenant. It's kingdom law. In other words, it's his pleasure to give me the kingdom. In other words, everything in the kingdom is mine. Whatever I need at any time. So, if that's true, I should never have lack. I should not want. I, just like the scripture says... I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Amen? Well, all I can say is the psalmist David never turned on TBN. Anyway, <clears throat> you turn on TBN, you'll see, well, maybe they're not righteous or maybe they're not his seed. I don't know. But anyway, they're on there begging for whatever it is. Right? God doesn't need to beg. Amen? What, what can you give God? Isn't that what he told David? What can you make? You're going to make me a house. What are you going to make for me? You're going to make me a temple? What are you going to make with your hands... That would suit me. You see what I'm saying? But we think that God needs our money. Right? Now, He doesn't need your money. Now, that doesn't... But you have to understand that now, since, I, since I'm living by kingdom principle, I actually now, when I check the books, I give more now. I'm, I'm actually closer to 30 or 40% instead of 10%. Why? Because I give to any man that asks me. I give to those that have need. I, I, and the amazing thing is, I'm constantly blessed. I'm... You know, whatever I need to do, I can do. That doesn't mean I have money piled up, because I don't. But I'll tell you what, when I need it, it's there. And so, it doesn't matter where I go, doesn't matter what happens, I didn't lose a dime in the stock market. 
Not a dime. Why? Because I'm not investing in the stock market. I invest in heaven. And, and heaven's kingdom is not hurt by the stock market. You understand that? And when everything else is going bad, I guarantee you, people that walk in kingdom principle will walk right on through it. And we're going to have to be like Joseph and have enough for us and enough for the others too. Amen? That's what was so funny about the Y2K stuff. When everybody, see everybody stocking up food. And I, I, I told everybody, what are you going to do? If your neighbor comes to you and they're hungry, you're going to turn them away? You can't turn them away. You've got to feed them. And once they hear you got food, everybody's going to come. Your food's going to be gone in a day. I said, might as well just trust God and believe God and have one can of beans and say, Lord, bless it and let it multiply. I said, you don't, you don't need 20 cans of beans, right? And so, but we have to learn to walk in the spirit and in the spirit realm and not just in the, in the earth. Our problem is, see, here's the problem. People want to live resurrection life without ever dying. So you can't live resurrection life unless you die. Right? There's got to be a death before there can be a resurrection. Uh, we've always got people willing to raise the dead, but we never have anybody volunteering to be the dead to get raised. You ever notice that? <laughs> they never volunteer for that part. Okay, And you've got to be ready when it happens. You can't prepare for that. You can't say, well, I'm going to go to Walmart because I think somebody's going to drop dead over there in the you know, frozen food aisle. You know, or you can't be walking through there and wait for, they, for them to drop dead. And you go, well, put them in the freezer and I'll be back in three days. I've got to go fast and pray. Ain't gonna, you got to be ready then. You understand? That's why America's been as successful as she's been in her wars in the past because in times of peace, men prepare for war. So when need be, we can take the war to them instead of waiting until it comes to us. Amen? Now, I'm not trying to get political to make you agree with anything. I'm just saying that's the way the military thinks. Prepare now for what could be coming. Amen? That way you're not taken by surprise. problem with Christians is they all want to, you know, sit around and sing Kumbaya or whatever it is, or pass me not, O gentle Savior, you know, until crisis hits, and then they're hitting their knees and wearing out their knees on their pants up here at the altar, begging God to come by their house. You know, and even the Roman centurion, who wasn't even born again, knew better than that. He said, no, you don't have to come to my house. And yeah, we got Christians about, oh God, please come to my house. Lord, please show up. Please appear. Lord, please come touch my... And even the Roman centurion knew better than that. So we're not even, most Christians aren't even at that level yet, let alone walking as a new creation. But that, see, that's what John Lake understood. He underst and that's why this stuff about the, um, all this generational curse stuff, it's why it's so ridiculous. I mean, first off, a generational curse would have to come through your mother, your father, your grandfather, somebody down the line. All that says is you're not born again. You want freedom from generational curses? Real simple, get born again. Many of you get born again, that generational curse stops because you're not of that generation anymore. Your generation goes back to Jesus. It doesn't go through that. Why do you, why do you want to keep claiming your generation to your great granddaddy? First off, and see, again, Ezekiel 18 says that's not all that generational curse stuff is not true. But secondly, the amazing thing to me is you think by the teaching on generational curses that if you go back in and find out who did that sin, you can repent for them and that you can get it taken off of you, or that you can break this thing off somehow in that way. Okay, the only things you're going to go back to your great-grandfather, well, what was great-grandfather like? Well, you know, he was an alcoholic. Well, that's my problem, too. Well, what else was he like? Well, you know, he liked the women. Well, see, that's, that's my problem, you know? It was all my great-grandfather's problem. Okay, now, do you think he might have died with any sins people didn't know about? Because if he didn't confess them, if nobody knew about them, and those things passed to you too, there's no hope for you because you don't know where to go back to break it off. Right? All right, let's look at it another way. It says in the three or four... Now, this is part of the teaching, so I'm not, I'm not varying. You can see it's all in your manual. But you have to remember, I wrote the manual, so I don't have to turn to the page and read it. Right? It comes out. Okay? <clears throat> the disciples didn't have a Bible. They remembered what Jesus said. Amen? All the scriptures were kept, you know, the Torah and all that was kept in the, in the synagogues and the, the epistles weren't written for 30 years after that till most of them had actually died. And so, you know, you don't always have to read it straightforward. You can know it. And if you don't know it, if they ever take your Bible, you're in trouble. Right? So it has to be here. It has to be able to flow out of you. On the street, you can't go, let me tell you something, devil. Wait a minute. Let me find this. <laughs> Yeah, it says right here. The devil's going to say, I don't recognize King James. 
or whatever you use. And I don't recognize NIV, the nearly inspired version. He said, <clears throat> see, you've got to have it in you to where what comes out of you comes out with an authority that the devils listen because they recognize authority and not just what you quote. Amen? It's not a formula. It's not a, a, an incantation where you try to invoke God's power because of some spell you're trying to read. You understand? That's witchcraft. Leave that for them. They don't, you know, they don't want to walk in real power. So leave that for them. And I've got to send you to break already. Boy, you people, you just need break after break. <laughs> now, yeah, I'll tell you what. Um, well, I'll tell you this first time we we'll go to break. We'll only be about five minutes over. In several of the verses, and if you read through your manual, you'll see it there. It, several of them are re-quoting the same thing over and over again. Two of them say, down to the third and the fourth generation. Then one of them says, even to the tenth generation. Now, the problem with this is this. If you go and you say, down to the fourth generation, let's say you start here. Forget the thumb. It's not a finger. Remember, they told you that. Okay? <clears throat> First generation. Here's the grandfather that son, or the person that, I'm not going to say grandfather, but the person that sinned. Right? Then, so, down to the third and fourth generation, that means that his son and his son's son and his son's son's son are just doomed. Right? I mean, it's just the way it works. It just flows down to all of them. And so, if that's true, then it doesn't matter what happens. But the problem is, to this person, you see, now, to this person, he's number one. He was the first one. But to this person, he's number one. You, you understand what I mean? Because he's the second one. Now, to this person, he's... So, technically, if you get... There's no end. You see? Because by the time you get to the fourth generation... Well, the fourth generation is somebody else's first generation. Right? So it, it would just be perpetual. So when you read, and that's why he said down to the tenth generation, because he's saying, look, it's innumerable. What I'm trying to tell you is this the sin carries through the you know, through all humanity. Now, when people today they will say things like, Well, you know, but my, my daddy was an alcoholic, and that's why I'm an alcoholic. No, you're an alcoholic because you keep putting that bottle to your mouth. <laughs> Alright? Nobody poured it down your throat. Nobody made you do it. Or if they did, you know, forgive them, right? And it's, see, what we need to quit talking about, I'm waiting for the first book I see, not on generational curses, but on generational sin. Because it's not a generational curse. A generational curse says, I can't do nothing about it. It's not my fault. I'm a victim. But... When they start saying, you know what, your problem is not a generational curse, your problem is generational sin. Your daddy sinned and now you're a sinner. So quit sinning. Get born again. You get born again, now your generation doesn't flow from your daddy anymore. Now it flows from your heavenly father. And out of him there's no evil thing, but every good and perfect gift comes from him. Isn't that right? My bloodline does not go back to my earthly father. My bloodline goes back to my heavenly father. And until you see that, you'll always be walking like people in the old covenant, and like people in the Gospels that are always saying, Jesus, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Rather than being like Peter that says, listen, what I got, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Generational curse teaching never promotes authority or power or any type of responsibility. It always promotes weakness and, and a victim mentality. Amen? And the main thing about it is that Jesus didn't practice it. And our problem is this. Here's the difference. And this is what proves the church has no power or has not been walking in power. The church tries to disciple a person into freedom. Jesus set people free and then discipled them. See the backwards church? You see that there? And the reason they try to disciple them or as I would say counsel them into freedom is because they don't have the power to break the thing off of them. Because when you have the power to set somebody free, you don't spend a lot of time in trying to figure out where it came from. Right? When a policeman comes up on a scene and there's a burglar in the house, he's not really at that point looking for the way he broke in. He's just looking to get the criminal out. Right? The investigation is saved for later. Right? If at all. Amen? Our problem is we want to come in and look like experts and tell you every detail. Oh, yeah, I know this about this and this. That. Oh, oh. And see, this takes us right to the next point. Just another aspect of teaching. This idea that every sickness has a spiritual root. 
Well, in one way that's true. Uh, the spiritual root of every sickness is the devil. Alright? Now, from that would be the sin principle that comes from the devil. But, every sickness is not caused by a sin. Alright? In James, it says that very thing. It says, well, I'm not going to go into all of it because we're going to look at it later. But it says that these elders are going to come and pray over this sick person, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And it says, and the Lord shall raise them up, meaning heal them. And then it says, after that, after they're healed, it says, and if he has committed any sin, it should be forgiven him. That means that every sickness is not caused by sin, or he wouldn't have said, if he committed sin, he would have said, in whatever sin he has committed, it will be forgiven. So the if means that every sickness is not caused by sin. Amen? Now, the reason I say that is because when you start, and there's books out there, and I've met with the people, I've got stories. I'll give testimony, or I'll give these stories a little bit later on, and I'll give names. All right? I haven't been too shy about it so far, so I probably won't start then. <clears throat> Nothing against these people, they just don't know. All right? I'm not putting them down, I'm just saying they don't know. But you ought to know who they are so you don't buy their books, because then you won't know either. Right? You can pass on ignorance. Right? It is possible. Okay? So you don't want to you don't want that impartation. Amen. <clears throat> but when you believe, for instance, I'll give you two of the main ones. Lower back problems are caused by unresolved grief. Okay, that's one of them. Uh, second one is uh, what oh yeah, arthritis. Arthritis comes from a bitter spirit. If you have arthritis, you're a bitter person and you need to get forgiveness and renounce arthritis and then you'll be set free. Now, here's the problem with that. The, the problem with these kind of teachings is this. Anytime somebody comes to you and says, here's my problem, either mentally or by a book, and there's plenty of them out there, you're going to look or you're going to look at this person and your mind is going to run down the list of, okay, arthritis, or, oh, bitterness, okay. Oh, okay, well, you need to renounce bitterness immediately. Whether you say it to them or not, you are judging them immediately. You shift to judge. And don't say you don't because you have to. You understand? To say that that sickness is always attached to that, that sin is to pronounce judgment. Now, Jesus never did that. Okay? Jesus set people free. See, what, what we tell the church is this. Don't sin. Get the sin out. Don't sin anymore, and Jesus will heal you. Jesus said, you're forgiven. You're healed. Now go and sin no more. The backwards church. You see? He wasn't as interested in finding and pointing out the blame as he was in setting the captive free. Our problem is, since generally people don't walk in power, we want to find reasons for them to have to do something so that when they leave our presence, they're not healed and it's not our fault. Because they got to go get right with God. Right? That's your job. Right? You set them free and, and then tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. Now what are you going to do with that? And then they will either choose to follow him or not. Amen? This is a, this is a Jesus way of ministry. It's the way he did it. It's not... <clears throat> the only book you find this in... So far, is this one. Okay? I catch myself going to bookstores, Christian bookstores, and standing there for an hour, looking at the shelves, looking and thinking, what am I... I wish I could find something worth reading. And God actually spoke to me one time. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm looking for something to read. And he said, you're not going to find it. And I said, why not? And he said, you haven't written it yet. I thought, better get busy writing. So now we've been writing. And, I, and I'm not saying I'm the only person that knows this. There's other people that know it. You understand it? We're walking in it. But now I've got 15 books that are all ready to go to the publisher. And we're going to get them out there. And they have this teaching. And it's going to be widespread. Because it's going to have to be if we're going to turn the tide. Amen? And so y'all can become deliverers instead of counselors. Jesus never called you to be a counselor. We have a great counselor for that. He called you to be deliverers. And not judges, but deliverers. Amen? Go to break. Not long, but go to break. Okay. <laughs>